The Ministry of Community and Cultural Affairs is fundamentally about people. Therefore, the Ministry is proud of its programs, Treasures, which brings to the fore facets of Bermuda's culture through the lives of people, our senior citizens. We treasure our seniors as they share their memories with us. They provide enrichment and show us the broad spectrum of our cultural mosaic. I hope that you will enjoy, as I shall, treasures. Sisters, Miss Hope Bascom and Mrs. Miriam Dickinson take us on a stroll down memory lane to a simpler time. Mrs. Dickinson starts by telling us about their family history. My grandfather was a pilot, Henry Gilbert, and he lived in the wreck house uh, off Somerset Bridge and um, often went out to meet the boats coming in in order to save them from being wrecked on the on, um, on the Mutish reefs. There were times when the weather was so bad that he had to go right on to the States. And of course, I've heard my mother say how glad the family was because he was a pretty strict disciplinarian. And having him out of the house gave them a little bit of freedom. And then it was the joy of looking forward to him bringing him some gift when they returned. So that was my maternal grandfather. My, my maternal uh, grandmother was Rowena Gilbert. And uh, my father's people, uh, my father's father was Daniel Bascom from Bayless Bay, and his mother was Margaret Bascom from, from Bayless Bay. Now, just how my parents met and married, I don't know, but they were married in 1908, and um, my father was uh, R.H.D. Bascom. He loved those initials, Robert Henry Disney. He was a dentist. And uh, he married my mother, who's our latter Jane Gilbert. And of that union, there were three children. My sister, uh, who is six years older than I, my brother, who is four years younger than I, and I'm like a sandwich in between. But we had a very happy childhood, although they set high standards for us. And um, we loved them very much, and they cared for us. And we had family. Uh, to a great degree, something that we don't see quite that much in Bermuda today. But we're certainly glad that we have something to look back on because we have examples, particularly as I look back on my mother being a woman, she makes me feel that I can be somebody and uh, I can make a contribution. Her sister, Miss Hope Bascom, reflects on her early childhood memories. I was born at the Cavello Bay. Uh, there's a house way on the hill. Some of you may know that house, and uh, that's where I was born. And uh, being that I had no brother and sister at that time, I had to do a lot of the playing by myself. I would play on the outside where there were some bushes that where I could sit in them, and, and it felt like I was sitting in a little chair. And um, I was quite happy doing that, and then for play things, I remember that I would collect a lot of boxes, like shoe boxes, and join them together and run them around the house. And uh, to my mother, my mother was like the station. So mm -hmm. I would run them around and um, stop there. I don't remember too much about my childhood, but as I said, there were very few friends that I had, one or two that would come by and play with me. Uh, coming to this house here at Bob's Valley, I was five years old. My father took me by the hand one night and said, we are going over to see the house where we're going to live, and I want you to come along with me. So that was, that was an experience for me, really. And. Um, Around that time, there's one thing that kind of stands out. I, I think I was a little older then. The way we traveled to Hamilton, it was a day's journey. We would go by a bus that left at 9 o'clock in the morning and reached Hamilton at 12. 
we shopped at twelve uh, from twelve to three. Then at three the bus would leave again and back to Somerset we would come. So you can see that was a full day from nine to twelve getting there, shopping for a couple of hours, then from three to six getting back home. <laughs> that stands out. And that bus would carry not only people, but it would carry little animals hanging on the side in a box like chickens and and rabbits and so on that were going to be delivered to other people and then they would stop and pick up people mm -hmm. along the road that that really stands out i can't remember anything about um us living at cavallo bay but most of my childhood memories center around bob's valley where we lived where I lived until I married in 1971. Um, for some reason, I seemed to be what they used to call a tomboy. I loved uh, sports and fishing and swimming, and I even used to go hauling with, with, with a, an uncle and all of mine. And the fish he would catch, he would share with our family here. It was a happy childhood, as I said before. I, I found it easy to make friends and and so I enjoyed living in Somerset in my childhood days. As little children, we would make little homes in the, in the trees, the pigeonberry trees. We would um, set up our table with a, a, a big stone was the table, and pieces of broken china was the... Uh, dishes. Dishes, yes, and we would separate. We had a kitchen, the bedroom, dining room, just like I well, guess we saw our parents have. Both sisters recall their early days at school in Somerset. I went to school when I was seven because my mother taught me at home. Of course, she, um, we omitted to say that she was a teacher herself. And uh, she taught me my, you know, the beginning things of school, the alphabet, the, mm -hmm. how to count and how to read. And so uh, at seven years of age, I went to school. I, I think I went in what they called the first grade at that time. And um, I moved along pretty well from class to class. We had a very strict teacher, uh, Mrs. May, Miss May Stowe, and I know some of you remember her. And it was Huntley School that I attended at yes. first. And um, as I said, uh, I moved along, and soon I was graduating from Huntley. And uh, we, the, the Huntley joined with West End as time went on. The, the schools were amalgamated. But you went to Sam Secondary from Huntley. Yes. When you finished at Huntley, you went right. on to Sam Secondary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing. Um, I went to school when I was about seven for the same reason that Mom had sort of uh, prepared me. And um, I think when I left the Huntley School, I was about 12 and uh, went to the Sam Secondary School. That was a school that was started by civic-minded people, people who felt that um, if the children were unable to go to the Barclay, well, why not attend the school in the parish? And we had some good teaching there. Interestingly, Dame Marjorie Bean was one of my teachers, and I feel quite honored to think that I sat under her tutelage. Um, and I graduated, we graduated from Sand Secondary. I graduated with three certificates. My sister graduated with a junior certificate. And then she went into teaching before me because you came out of school before me. Yes, um, I did go into teaching sort of early because at that time there was not that much expected of you to become a teacher. In other words, you could teach if you hadn't trained abroad. So I went into teaching. I think I was 19, not quite sure, but um, I, I loved to teach. Uh, at first, I, I didn't want to go continue school, but my mother said, you have to keep in school. And I'm glad now that I did. She seemed to have a real vision 
uh, for her children. She yes. wanted them to move forward. And um, I enjoyed a very long teaching career uh, for 40, I think it was 41 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, up to now, I love to teach. Although I'm not in school, I still love to teach. I teach at my church at times. It seemed like we followed in the footsteps of one another because I too taught at the Huntley School when I had graduated from high school. And uh, then when the schools amalgamated, I came to the West End where I taught for about 28 years. And then when I married in 71, then I went to the Francis Patton School. Um, we were privileged to get some local training because the Department of Education ran a teacher's course and uh, we both took it and passed. Mm -hmm. And then during the summer months, the department brought in teachers or professors from Queen's University and my sister and I benefited from those teachings also. And later I was able to go to Ottawa Teachers College where I did a year of teacher's training and then returned to Bermuda and taught for around 40 years, 39 years, and enjoyed it immensely. When I look back at those days, uh, I feel honored in thinking that there were some very important people in Bermuda whose lives I slightly touched, such as uh, Bishop Ewan Rattery, the Bishop of the Anglican Diocese, Bishop Vinton Anderson, uh, presiding elder Malcolm Eve in the AME churches, and Mr. Randy Horton, a great sportsman. I wish I could say that all of my students did that well, but some come and some go, as we know. But teaching was a, was a tremendous experience for me. And when I meet some of my students today, it just, I feel so grateful that in some way I influence them to be the type of persons they are. It's strange that um, she spoke along that line because I have often felt that I was too strict with, with the children, but I was following the pattern that had been set before me. Very mm -hmm. strict. You must obey. If not, you were flogged. So at times now, I will say to the children I meet or who uh, recognize me, I'll say, I was pretty hard, wasn't I, when you were in school? He said, oh, no, Miss Boston, that did me a lot of good. That was good for me. Yeah. So that makes me feel a little better than I felt otherwise. It reminds me of a warden, one of the girls I taught who was a warden at co-ed. And she uh, spoke of how stern I was, like I was a no-nonsense teacher. <laughs> but then I felt complimented when she said, um, that's the kind of teachers they need nowadays. <laughs> So I couldn't have been too bad after all. Yeah, that, that, is, that is being said to me, too, even now. The other day I met one of the teachers from the West End, and we spoke of bygone days, and she feels also that, you know, teachers can be a little more strict, I guess. I, I'm not sure all that she meant, but mm -hmm. I know she commanded uh, the way we were back there. I also taught at the uh, casemates prison a while. Speaking of teaching, I thought I would bring that in. If it, and um, I remember one thing stands out in my mind. This gentleman could not write his name. And by the end of that term, or that time I was there, he was able to write his name, and he was so happy. He now could write his name instead of putting an X on the papers mm -hmm. uh, that were brought up to him. Yes. Right. Casemates brings back memories to me in that I, when I was there teaching the choir, helping to teach the choir, I discovered that quite a few of the the residents, I would say, at the prison were unable to read. And it made me say to myself, possibly, that's why so many of them get in trouble. They can't sit and read a newspaper or read a magazine, and therefore with a mind that is as idle as that, it's not, e it's not uh, hard for them to turn to something that they shouldn't do. But we need to um, 
have some type of sympathy for these people, but also provide a means whereby they can improve themselves. And I think government is, is going in that direction now. The church has played a very large role in shaping their lives from an early age. I would say the most exciting experience in my life was when I was converted to Jesus Christ. I was 15 years of age, and uh, this group of uh, religious fanatics, I guess some would call them, came mm -hmm. to Somerset, and they were called the Holy Rollers. They said, people said that they climbed smooth walls, they threw babies up in the air and caught them. And uh, I wanted to go and hear and see what was really happening. Uh, my mother took me, but uh, soon after that, uh, my father said, no, you're not going with those people. They're not educated, they're, they're ignorant, you must stay with the AME church. And I'll never forget a, a remark he made about the leader. He said, he is not worth the mucilage that you put on a farthing stamp. <laughs> The same group, it was under the same group that I was converted. I had been playing, uh, filling in for an organist at one of the AME churches, and um, just to be able to stay out a little longer and not go home that early, we, a friend and I went to this same church, same church group, and under the preaching and the ministry and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I gave my heart to the Lord. Of course, by that time, I think I could have been the straw that broke the camel's back because my father didn't uh, say too much about my being a member of that group. But that's where the Lord called me, so that's where I stayed. I uh, soon be uh, became a worker in the church, but not before I was filled with the Spirit, as some call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or by whatever name, it doesn't matter. But there was such a vast change in my life. Yes. Such a boldness came into my life, and thank God, up to now, and I'm 85 years old now, thank God I still have that. I, I endeavor to keep it in close contact with the Lord through prayer and the reading of His Word mm -hmm. and the fellowship of the saints. So uh, I soon became a worker. My first office was a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had what we call open air meetings. I guess some of you remember that name. And uh, the Lord just used to touch me and give me the boldness to preach his word. And I remember one time, this is a little embarrassing, but anyway, I was preaching, I guess I was so heavily anointed and you know, I, you know, some of you know me, you know what I, you know how I carry on when I preach. And they told me afterwards that my bloomers were showing. Now at that time, some of you will remember the kind of bloomers we wore. I don't see any of them anymore, but <laughs> I didn't mind. I was letting my testimony go forth to anyone who was willing to hear. I joined the same church that I was converted in, as did my sister. The, it's called Beulah Tabernacle. And um, f if I remember correctly, my first office was that of secretary of the missionary department. But then we, we moved up from one area of service to another. I worked with the young people, played the piano, helped to practice the choirs, and, and then went into what is called the district, because there are six churches under the dis Diocese of the United Holy Church. And uh, we have served, I've served both locally in that church, and then I've served in the district, and I've served abroad uh, on the missionary uh, department. So the church gave us a, a wonderful opportunity of developing our gifts and learning to know God in a real personal way. The experience that she spoke of about being filled with the Spirit, I experienced the same thing many years after my conversion. But she went and came into the experience quite soon after getting to know the Lord as her Savior. God has blessed me to travel. I, I, my sister used to call me a globetrotter because I was always out somewhere 
traveling. During school time, though, uh, during one of the vacation periods, I had the privilege to go to England, to six countries in Europe, Spain, Italy, uh, Germany, and so on. I forget. I can't remember all of them. But um, also, I, I was able to visit the convocations there, which is like a conference here. And as I became the district missionary president, that means over all the churches, I had the privilege of visiting these meetings and speaking and just, just enjoying the Lord and, and enjoying ministry to others. You went to Africa also. Yes. Um, as in the line of missions. Right. I went to Africa and I did missionary work there. I taught and um, I preached. They have, we have a school. My sister has, re has been a part of Africa since I have, so she probably can tell you some more about that. But I did teach there and one thing I enjoyed was tramping through the, the bushes. I, yeah, bushes. I forget what they call that now. Going to the churches, just tramping and going, walking over puddles of water and on on uh, tree trumps that were put across the as water. As bridges, yes. As bridges. It was it was just wonderful. I enjoyed those periods there. Mm -hmm. My association with the church also has um, open doors for me to travel. Talking about travel, um, I recall that when uh, my uh, husband, Bishop Norris Dickinson, uh, was visiting with me, getting me interested, mm -hmm. I told him I liked to travel. So he knew that when he married me, mm -hmm. he was marrying a traveler. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said before, in interest of the church, doors have opened for me to travel. I've traveled as far as Trinidad and Barbados, St. Lucia, um, St. Kitts, and then the States where our headquarters church is, and um, Canada. And uh, speaking of Africa, my husband and I went there to visit because one of the uh, Bermuda girls was on the station then, and uh, the schools naturally attracted my attention. And on my returning to the States and sitting in a, a meeting with the bishops and what have you, they saw my interest in the schools, and uh, I was made the advisor of the missionary schools in Africa. We traveled, my husband and I traveled to Africa four, on four occasions, and it was, it was, well, it would take time to describe the amount of enjoyment and, uh, that we got, because people's cultures mean uh, quite a bit to me. I like to meet people of different cultures and and get near them and get a feel of them. And Africa gave me that okay, um, opportunity on four different occasions. My prayer band, which I had uh, held for about 27 years, insisted that I take them somewhere. Now, I've learned that in the Lord's work, unless you are led of the Lord to True. do things, they may not just turn out right. So I spent much time in prayer. I think I prayed about five months because different countries, different islands were coming into my mind, into my mind and, and passing. But when Haiti came, somehow I, I was stopped right there to consider that place because, and I didn't remember it then because about 20 years before that, I was in a convention, and there was a lady who had been in Haiti working for some years, and as she described that place, in my heart, I said, I'd like to go there sometime. Mm -hmm. Now, I had no prayer ban. I had nothing whereby I could step out with. But then praying, and it came, I felt, truly, this is it's the, the place, Lord. Yes. And so we went, about 20 of us went in 1989. <laughs> I must remember my dates. And uh, a, a year or so after that, my bishop, Bishop J. T. Billings, who has passed away now, called me and said, we are considering having you 
as the representative to Haiti for the general church. Now, the Lord knows nothing like that was ever in my mind. But from that time on, and that, as I said, I went in 1989, and from that time until now, I've been going back and forth to Haiti. How many September times? coming will be my sixth time there. I remembered uh, part of our work here in Bermuda, where the Lord privileged me to help to found two congregations, two churches here. One is Faith Tabernacle and one is Gospel Tabernacle. And I look back on that with a lot, with a lot of gratitude that I was permitted to do something of that nature. These inspiring sisters reflect on the past and offer some words of wisdom to the younger generation for the future. Looking back at Bermuda now, the good old days as mm -hmm. some folks would call it, and, and um, comparing the present with the past, I can't say that I'm sorry that I grew up in the past because I believe that there was the friendliness and the neighborliness and the respect for one another that we had one for the other in those days is something that is not too evident in Bermuda now. We lived like a family. Bermuda was a big neighborhood. Now everything was not 100% and not everybody was perfect, a perfect person. But there was a, a friendliness here among us in Bermuda that it needs to be encouraged today. But we have progressed. I mean, Bermuda is a beautiful country. And I'm not ashamed of the smallness of it because we have lovely homes, we have lovely hotels, we have lovely schools, and lovely churches. But I think we need to get back to realizing that we are one another's brother and one another's sister. And to the young folks who might listen to this um, taping, I want to say that you are very precious to Bermuda's future. I rem recall when I was at the co-ed prison a few months ago and seeing a number of, of young men there, fine young men, I was stirred to speak to them and tell them that life should mean more to them than what, than what they were involved in that put them there, that Bermuda needs them. You young people are Bermuda's future. and what. The future will be depends upon what you decide to make it. You're making your decisions now. Let's be people that we can be proud of. Let's be people that can make a worthwhile contribution so that uh, when you look back, should you ever live to be my age, you can be satisfied that you fulfill God's purpose for your life. Now, in being that type of person, you are going to need the help of God. So I would advise you strongly to give yourself to the Lord and let him take your life over and make you a worthwhile person. Yes, I would say Bermuda is a good place to live in. I love it. No matter how many times I travel, and I, I can't tell you the number of times it's been, I guess, up in the 40s that I have traveled over my lifetime. But I'm always ready to come back to, to Bermuda when mm -hmm. the time is up. But as was said, um, there are so many changes, and some of them really break my heart. Because I know that our parents expect more of us, the government expect, expects more of us, and we should expect more of ourselves. I'm talking mainly to our young people, our young boys and girls. They're, there is something worthwhile for you to go after. For those good old days, as my sister said about the friendliness and the um, love and the sharing that we had one with the other, I would love to see more of that back. <laughs>